It's Artifacts, the show that brings the arts and the Twin Cities to you. On this edition, Beth Robinson is fired up about pottery. Deborah Fouch and Michelle Wiegand talk about artist housing. Kevin Kling toots a didgeridoo with John Van Orman on banjo and Dick Hensold on Northumbrian pipes. And the singing ranger Charlie McGuire sings about the Mississippi. Plus, Roaring reporter Gina Filigenzi talks music with council member Jim Nyland. All this and more on Artifacts, July 1999. Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the show about the arts in the Minneapolis area. The good old arts and the good old controversial arts. The local arts community in the last so many years has encountered, now get this, sexual improprieties, embezzlement, strikes and pickets, censorship of and by arts groups, poisoning, allegations of Nazi looted art in the local collection, attempted murder, a bomb incident, a triple homicide, and no less than two valuable violins stolen. And now a local actor has been busted as a 70s revolutionary. Well, we're going to stick to tamer stuff this month on Artifacts. We've got Beth Robinson, who runs Fired Up, where the only kill is for clay. Michelle Wiegand from PRG and artist Deborah Fouch will be talking about artist housing. And Kevin Kling and John Van Orman are here to talk about folk song and dance of Minnesota. And to wrap up with some performance, the singing ranger, Charlie McGuire, and his friends will be here to perform. We've also got Gina Filigenzi with council member Jim Nyland about hot music in Minneapolis. I'll be back with Beth Robinson right after this clip from On the Ropes. I've basically been at this gym for like 16 years. 16 years as a fighter, now as a trainer. Every other gym is like a business venture. Best style gym is more like a family, you know what I'm saying? At times, you know, I get, I get fed up, I say I'm gonna leave this gym. See, it's hard to leave this gym. We don't have a lot of equipment. We don't have a lot of glamour. We didn't came from the no heat to some heat, from no light to some light. The pocket missing off the pants. Sometimes the guy that don't have it, he's hungry because he's trying to get it. Every day we walk the same streets, the same corner that smells the same eyes. Simply staying alive, we see the world through the same eyes. The daily question what we got, have or have not. If you ain't out to get mine, then I'm out to get ours. You know it used to be sour, black people used to be power. With a fish now, who counts? See Popo every hour. They know the spot like who does it. Over my block, steady bunching. And I know that they know who runs it. But they ain't there when the guns it. But let me pack a steel weapon. And let the coat when I'm stepping. And I get pushed down, past Stop with big talk and questions. We're here to live, we forget. So all my kids be back there. I got no time. I'm set up. Drive out with text and jetty. Never been called or arrested. So God bless us for petty. When even thought was invented. Return to send the convention. And every ghetto and jungle, they keep the wisdom and humble. So Shaitan made me stumble. My foundation can't crumble. We ain't rich, but we ain't tired. Grab the tea. Cause these streets can't hold me down. I'm carefree. And if you ain't trying to win, then it must be me. And there's no place I'd rather be. Well, what we just saw was an all-too-short clip from a movie called On the Ropes. It's an award-winning film about three boxers all at a pivotal moment in their lives. And that movie's part of the Dockers' classically independent film festival showing at the Walker Arts Center the last two weekends in July. And by the way, local filmmakers also will be screened at that festival. Well, next, my first guest is a woman named Beth Robinson, and I'm excited to have her here because she's the proprietor of an interesting business called Fired Up. Beth? Glad to have you here. Nice to be here. And very sincerely, when I first heard about this from a colleague, um, I don't think anything else like this exists in the Twin Cities. Could you just tell me and our viewers here what Fired Up is as a business? Sure. The main purpose for Fired Up is to provide a facility for people who do pottery as a hobby to those that are trying to develop their own clientele for their pottery. And we have several gas kilns, electric uh, wheels, electric kilns, uh, glazing materials. So what they become is a member and then they have access to the equipment. That sounds like a great resource. And I'm assuming that you didn't just wake up one day and say, there are potters out there who need this. <laughs> I bet you had a background in this too, is that right? Well, what I really had is I had taken a wonderful class over at Northern Clay Center, which is a great place to take Nice back. resource. Oh, yeah. great classes. And had done it and really enjoyed doing pottery and decided I wanted to do it as a hobby. But there was no place to fire your work. And so the only place you could go was 
Northern Clay or one of the other places like Minnetonka or Edina had classes. But then when classes were done, you didn't have any place to work. Oh, is that how it works? I mean, as long as you're taking classes, oh, yes. you can use the facilities, but it isn't, you can't just drop in. Right, correct. Oh, all right. Well, that'd be a problem then. Oh, yeah. So yeah. as a hobby, if you want to do it at home and under your own speed and all those kinds of things, the only, there is no place to go. Well, what would happen? I mean, I, I have this impression that there are hundreds, maybe, of, of potters, avocational potters out there with, with, with clay, what, just drying out on the shelves in the garage? Well, or? I don't think so, but I think what happens is that people start, just keep taking classes and, and, oh, and wait right. the four weeks in between the classes. Or they know someone who has an electric kiln, so they change mm -hmm. the kind of clay that they use so they can use a lower fire clay or they know a production potter. Well, a lot of us don't know production potters. So. Yeah, I don't know too many myself. Yeah. So, so they're just, scrambling is what you're saying. Yes. In fact, I do know that Fired Up right now is the only place that has a gas-fired kiln that people can gain access to without having um, being in a class. Oh, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> and we should mention where this is. It's right here in Minneapolis. That's correct. It's at 1701 East Hennepin, right at Stenson and East Hennepin. Okay, so technically northeast Minneapolis, I think, Very on that good. side uh, of the street. There. Do you, are you part of the Art of World thing that goes on? We, we have the past two years. We've only been around for about 14 months, and so this mm -hmm. was a, really our first year that we had any kind of pottery there. Right. Um, the first year we asked someone to come in to have some pottery because right. we didn't have right. any right. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, 14 months, so then you, you had just started when the, what, uh, the, the 98 Art of World was happening Absolutely, there. yeah. Um, now, you come out of a bit of a business background, so that's not the scary part for you? No, um, the, the part that worked really well, or where I was really lucky, is my instructor, Tina Eldridge, and myself. I was sort of the money person behind it in the business background, and she provided the technical aspects, because firing a kiln and dealing with clay issues, what questions people have, and all those kinds of things, you need someone who knows much more about clay than I do. Well, and, 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 and the heat. I mean, I think you were telling me 2,300 degrees. Right. We do cone 10, what's called reduction firing in our gas kiln, which is... That means it's hot. Really hot. Really hot. Yeah, you'd burn the gingerbread if you put it in there. Right. The first time we fired the kiln and it got to over 1,500 degrees, I realized that I was creating lava and there, you know, if something happened, there was no way you were going to cool that <laughs> off. Head for the high ground. Really? That's pretty impressive. Now, you, you mentioned your mentor, I think. Um, and you brought some wonderful pieces here. Did I overhear you as you're setting these out? Um, at least one of these pieces is by Yes, her? two of them. Let's take a quick look here. This is one of her little, her pot. She does this really nice little thing with the bumps. Oh, that is lovely. And yeah. I hope our camera can come in here because there's some nice texture on here. And they kind of drop down as this piece um, uh, uh, widens at the base And this here. is porcelain, which uh, people know about. It, it usually can, you, you can do it really thin. The hard part about pieces like this is having such a skinny, tiny neck. So she's quite good. I mean, that no. Do you work with a tool to get down in there? Well, she does both. She works with a little tool in her little hand, and she pulls it up. So, <laughs> so not my stubby finger. That right. wouldn't work. She okay. does a great job with with okay. those things. And, and that, that was her name is. Her name is Tina Eldridge. Okay. Who and else? she teaches at Northern Clay. So. Oh, all right. And who else does. do you have here? Okay, this woman. Her name is Barbara, and I never pronounce her Zav Zavruha. And this is her pottery. And this she, is lovely. Yeah. I really like this. Look at these. I like the blue here. Now, is this this is obviously a different kind of glaze? Yes, different glazes, and this is also a different kind of clay. This oh. is buff clay. Okay, nice earth tones on yeah, these. Yeah. yeah, I like that. And this is also Tina's, just sort of a sculpture piece. Now, is you this something you would put uh, flowers in and stems? Sure. Or, okay. Sure. It would be on your table, and just it, it's really a piece of art in and of itself. Yes, you could just leave it there. I mean, you wouldn't have to make use. I'd be doing something like toothbrushes or something. So this is very lovely. Yeah. And people have a sense of humor. This is uh, one of the women. She does wonderful. Oh, look at this! Yeah, this is great. Yep. Little tail here. Yep. And 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 it's sort of a sense of humor, kind of. Yeah. It makes me smile. That's why I brought it. <laughs> well, and it makes me smile. And one of the questions I just realized, you have some smaller pieces, such as this, that one of these you just showed, and there's something taller like this. Is this a problem in your kiln? I mean, how, what's the capacity of your kiln? Oh, our kiln is a 40 cubic. Oh, okay, so you can load that right. up. Right, we have what is called a car kiln, so the whole front door pulls out and then you load it up. Uh -huh. And so um, we have bricks that we put different shelf heights, and then if you have really tall stuff, you put it usually on the top because you can Okay. You can get a couple of feet. Okay. Did we miss one or two here? I don't want right. to overlook. This is a woman named uh, Jan, and she does porcelain. It's too bad you can't see the flowers. Let's hold it real tight. I don't know that the camera can pick this up, but the, embedded here in the same color under right. the glaze is a fairly subtle, and, and you're right, they're flower petals, aren't they? That's yep. lovely. And this is a nice Japanese student 
who came from Japan and he's still around and his name is Tetsuya. We call him T because it's just easier. <laughs> I love this yeah. sort of pinched yeah. uh, treatment on here. And this woman does teapots and her name is Judy. Oh, how nice. And again, a little speckling there, a little spotting. Yep. I, I just love that because there's a little sense of whimsy to it. Well, in most what you'll find, we have now 38 studio members um, that mm -hmm pay basically a fixed fee per month to use the studio and they all do different things. So what's really fun about the place yeah. is that you've got a lot of different variety. Um, when I started it, I had no intentions of being involved with like retail sales or those things, but we have started to sell the pottery. Was so. oh, that right out of Fire yep. Up? Yes. Oh, that's a nice service as well to these people then. Well, part of it is like most things, it's a progression. You know, people start out making things and then you do end up with a lot of pottery yeah. and so and There's, you got to move it a little bit somehow. And the fun part is when someone like Judy or any of us sell a piece of our own stuff to who's not a family member, you feel <laughs> really happy. Well, it's a victory, and that's that's great because, yeah. as you say, most of these people are not professional per se. No, not they're doing yet. it for the love of the right. work right. and the craft. I know one of our later guests, I think Michelle Wiegand, who's going to be on later in the show. She is a potter, and so she's excited by this sort of thing. Um, a couple of questions come to mind. Twenty-three hundred degrees. You're dealing with a large area, a lot of heat. Is it inherently dangerous, or is this just so well controlled by the oh. construction that it's not a problem? It's not a problem. We have two gas jets, and there's no gas under pressure, which would be the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the kiln is built out of what they call fire brick. So it withstands a lot more heat than that. And then we have um, a chimney that basically brings the heat up. So. Okay. So yeah, by the time it gets about six feet above the, the kiln, it reduces, I don't know how many degrees, but yeah. by the time it vents, you could probably, I don't know if you want to put your hand on top of the vent, but. I wouldn't um, choose. No. no, I might and then, watch someone else. And then for the, uh, the roof, we have an extra protection, it's called a thimble, which has um, asbestos in it so that okay. you don't dry out the roof over a period of time, and we mm -hmm. had inspectors come in to make sure that we did it right. Something else I learned in talking with you is that, um, and this goes back to the availability of such a facility is what you're saying is basically the differences between institutional um, uses, you know, at, at universities and schools or Northern Clay Center. Um, is there anything else like what you've done? I know you're pretty unique. You are unique in this area. Thank anything you. Else, <laughs> and, and your business, too. <laughs> uh, is there anything else like this elsewhere in the country? Have you people know, responded to this kind of need? I think part of it is, uh, part of the reason I did this is, again, I have a business background. Um, People are now aging and having, their young children are now older and being able to take care of, so they have free time and have a disposable income. And so they are looking at things to do with that time that they enjoy and to get back to the arts. So I think we're just at the beginning of where you're going to see more of those kinds of things happen because there are people out there that can do it now. Right, and, and they need a place right. to go. And I know there's a place in California and I've heard of some place in Connecticut, but those are only oh, two I've Long treks, long treks. Very long. <laughs> Beth, we're just out of time, but I'm sure there's a phone number people can call. Yes, 612-852-2787 or 612-852-ARTS. Oh, that's a nice acronym. Hi. That's great. Beth Robinson, fired up. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll be back in just a moment to um, do our monthly news bits about the arts here. But first, we're going to go and hear from Gina Filagenzi, our roving reporter, talking with Council Member Jim Nyland about hot music in town this month. Gina, she's on the loose. Stay tuned. Thanks, Phil. I'm standing just outside of Lee's Liquor Lounge, one of the many fine live music venues in the city of Minneapolis. And I'm joined today with a very special guest. He is an avid live music supporter and fan, and he is also one of our very own city council members. Minneapolis City Council member from the 6th Ward, Jim Nyland. Hey, Gina. Hi, how are you? Very good, very Thank good. Thank you for joining well, us today. Of course, thanks for having me on Artifacts. You're welcome. So let me ask you, council member by day. Rock and roller by night. Exactly. <laughs> how did you get into it? Well, sure. Well, fortunately, I grew up in a family that was in the music. My dad was really in the jazz and blues. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough that I was in college. I worked as a roadie for a while. I worked for Sire Records and Rough Trade Records. So I actually roadied for bands, helped put together concerts, that sort of thing. So I've always been very into music. It was up to me. I'd see a band every night. Of course, that's tough to do given anybody's job. But I just love music. It helps keep me sane. And tell me, 
me, what are some of your favorite spots to listen to live music, some of the best venues in Minneapolis? Well, of course, Lee's. Oh, I mean, that, that's the Minneapolis Roadhouse. If you like alternative country, Americana, whatever the word is, it's the place to come. The owner, Lou Sarian, is just a great guy, real character. And Nate Dungan, who's the leader of Trailer Trash, who plays here every Wednesday, books the joints. So just a tremendous place to come. And if you like to dance, swing dance, of course, it's, it's a fun place to come every Wednesday. Trailer Trash is here, and a lot of swing bands come and play through here. So that's one of my favorites. And of course, First Avenue and the 7th Street entry, again, another landmark. Steve McClellan runs that place, and again, they bring in national bands, tremendous bands all the time. So that, that's one of my favorite places. And I'd say another one, of course, would be the 400 Bar. Bill Sullivan runs that place on the West Bank, and again, another premier place to see music in town. So just off the top of my head, those are a couple favorites, but of course, you got Mario's Keller Bar, you got Mace Lax, you got so many other great places in town to see music. Mm -hmm. So give us the inside scoop here. What are the must-see acts, the up-and-coming shows, um, the hot picks for the month of July? Sure. I would say Sunday, July 25th, probably my pick of the month would be uh, Cheap Amato, great Japanese band, are opening up for Luscious Jackson at First Avenue. So that's definitely a good one to see. If you like jazz or Brazilian jazz, Catena Velasso, who was a big figure in the Brazilian New Song movement, is going to be playing at Northrop on uh, Monday, July 12th. And then, of course, right in early August is Cedar Fest, which is always fun. Often good bands play there. I remember one year Yola Tango played, one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. The Meat Puppets, of course, plays the huge show there a while back, so that's always a fun place to catch music in early August, too. Okay, so what is your favorite? Oh, gee, in terms of local bands, uh, 12 Rods are one of my favorites. We have the future of pop music in a lot of ways. Very tight band, one of the best live bands. The legendary Jim Reeves group, one of my absolute favorite local bands. I like Suck Patch a lot, which is kind of a local hip-hop combo. Um, I feel like the Beastie Boys, a little bit more melodic, a little more danceable. And one of my favorite ones from around Minnesota is Lowe, just a tremendous band from Duluth. Uh, kind, kind of like the Velvets at their mellowest with a little Joy Division and Flying Saucer Attack mixed in. So those are probably some of my favorite local bands right now. So we be going out and hitting the music scene tonight? Oh, absolutely. There's a great uh, double bill course across the river in our sister city, St. Paul, but at the Turf Club, another, another great club to see mm -hmm. music. Split Lip Rayfield are playing with the Meat Purveyors, and Meat Purveyors is just a tremendous band from Austin, great woman singer. So I saw caught part of their set at the Turf Club last time they played, so hopefully tonight I'll catch the whole set, but that's what I'll probably be doing tonight. Well, have fun. Well, thank you, Gina. And there you have it, first-hand information from the music expert himself, <laughs> Jim Nyland. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And remember, get out there and support the local music scene, and you never know, you just may run into Jim. I'm Gina Filagenzi, reporting for Artifacts, and back to you, Phil. Well, thanks, Gina. That was a nice report, and we'll be having Gina on future Artifacts shows out and about. Now for some Artifacts national and local arts news. The National Endowment for the Arts announced last month that Vanessa Wang has been named uh, a Director of Presenting and Multidisciplinary Arts. She'll be in charge of the NEA's work with presenters, local arts centers, and other community-based arts organizations. Wang is a multi-instrumentalist, a composer, and a performer. She begins at the endowment this month. A million artists marching on the Avenue of the Arts. Here in Minneapolis? No, not along the new corridor designated in our town, but rather in Philadelphia. A call is out for a million artists march on the Avenue of the Arts on Saturday, July 17th in the city of Brotherly Love. Part of the mission is to call to action artists of all mediums and disciplines. Organizers hope to take to Congress a million signatures, all supporting arts curriculum, just as a first step to their effort. They do have a website, by the way, millionartistmarch, that's one word, dot com, millionartistmarch.com. And if you're a fan of musical theater, a major exhibition of interest will be in town here in Minneapolis this summer. Red Hot and Blue, a salute to American musicals, opens July 17th at the Downtown Minneapolis Public Library. Billed as an entertaining look at the evolution of musical theater, the display includes kiosks, posters, photos, and interactive video. This free uh, exhibition was developed by the National Portrait Gallery, the National Museum of American History, and the Smithsonian Institution. You can see the exhibit during regular library hours, July 17th through August 17th. And that's the Artifacts News Bits for July. Uh, and I'll be back to talk about artist housing in South Minneapolis right after this art quote. Okay. Well, as long 
Well, our unfounded exuberance for Greenspan quotes ends this month. Our next topic is about artist housing on Chicago Avenue in South Minneapolis. It's an exciting project, and with me to talk about it is Michelle Wiegand, who is the Executive Director of PRG. Michelle, it's great to have you here. Nice it really to see is. You, Phil. And multi talented artist Deborah Fouch. And it's a pleasure to meet you nice and have you here. here. This is great. Um, artist housing, I know uh, in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, when I was working with the Minneapolis Arts Commission, there was a big topic. You know, a lot of artists in the Twin Cities. Um, and they need a place to, to, to live and to work. And so artist housing really started percolating as a topic. Mm -hmm. And I think in those days, St. Paul actually kind of led the charge. But I understand in talking with you two that some neighborhood people came up with an idea a while back to maybe create some artist housing in South Minneapolis. Deborah, could you give us a little bit of the origins as to how people started talking about this notion? It, it actually came from a couple block clubs. Ours is on 32nd and Columbus. Um, and the block club that's on 31 and Elliott, 31st and Elliott to 32nd. Okay. And we started meeting together at um, the Chicago Avenue Corridor meetings where um, when NRP started happening, there was um, people who would come and talk about what do we want to do about Chicago Avenue? It's the borderline between uh, Powderhorn neighborhood and Central. Okay, and Elliott is, is actually in the Powderhorn and, 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 and Columbus, And Columbus is in right. Central neighborhood. Great. What a nice coming together of yeah. two neighborhoods. Yeah, and, and we're a neighbor, both neighborhoods are populated with artists. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, rich. They're, yeah, yeah. We're, the, you can come in and buy a big duplex and have a space to work yeah. or live in an attic and not have a lot of space to work and then have to go find a studio space. And when we started talking about artists um, having space, we were also artists who wanted to live in neighborhoods and not live downtown in a warehouse. We want to have a garden. We want to be able to have our kids. So we started thinking about, okay, could we have artist housing where you have a house and a yard? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, your studios, space, right? and your studio yeah. space. And uh, there were pro there was two pieces of property that were pretty close together. On Elliott, it was, um, I don't remember the address, <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's in the 31. South of Lake Street. Yeah, South yeah. of Lake Street. It, and mm -hmm. there was a big piece of property that was going down. It was an apartment building that wasn't functional. Mm -hmm. And our, um, our block on 3200 in Chicago, uh, there were four pieces of property that were owned by one person, oh, and and that person got an illness and and okay, tried so to sell the and tried to sell the four as a block. Coming onto the market. Yeah, and tried to mm -hmm. sell the four as a block, and and actually the properties weren't being maintained very well. Yeah. And the block club started talking when they came up as a block. Okay, what could we do? Yeah. Well, and we had meetings for maybe two years. Okay. When did this we, all start? In um, probably 1990. Oh, okay. So way it, back. It's, it's been a while. Yeah. And and. And, and this was led by the block clubs themselves? Yeah, we, and then we what, started talking, we, in, yeah, what, can, what could we do? And, mm -hmm. the, well, NRP was coming to us saying, okay, block clubs, what do you want in your neighborhood? We should what explain to people, NRP is the Neighborhood Revitalization Program. Program. Which is a pot of money that neighborhoods can use to do revitalizing. Based on their own criteria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of it was supposed to be targeted toward housing or quality of life issues. Well, and that's and we were, point, we were trying yeah. to, we yeah. to, to affect... We could see that, that that little slot of housing needed some attention. We, right. We're actually, um, along around that block, we're really densely, um, it's a dense block because it's lots of duplexes, but we're lots of homeowners. Mm -hmm. It's homeowner occupied. Yeah. So we talk to each other about who our renters are and, and, and what kind of, and, and as this property was becoming unsettled, we, the block club would meet and say, okay, what could we do with this piece of property? Right. And we talked about um, homeless shelters and we talked about um, elderly housing. We talked about lots of things. We talked about taking it all down and having an urban forest. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> we really? Talked, That's we a radical about idea. Lots yeah. of things. You know, yeah. everybody got to bring in their thing, and the thing that most people agreed on was, okay, we already have artists in the neighborhood. What if we had them, um, the studios up toward the street, yep. which would be a buffer for your house. Street facing. Yeah. Yeah. So the the studio would buffer your house from yeah. the from the stuff that goes on a, on a busy street. Mm -hmm. And then your studio behind and a yard. Well, sounds and like then a and you know and your neighbors are artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and we also wanted nice to, co location. Yeah, and we do have a lot of artists in the neighborhood and we also wanted kind of a focal point for them. Mm -hmm. Like a place where they'd be meeting. Yeah. And yeah. A little critical mass of them there. Yeah. Well now I've got to ask because you had mm -hmm. this idea and there was an opportunity on the real estate side. Mm -hmm. How did that come over to PRG? And we should ask, uh, first of all, PRG is a development organization? Right, mm -hmm. it stands for Powderhorn Residence Group, and we're a nonprofit community development corporation with a mission to provide affordable housing and housing-related services. And we had four blocks up the corridor. We had done, well, actually two blocks mm -hmm. up. We did Dovetail, which was a 10-unit mm -hmm. development for 
low to moderate income families and dovetail being a, a, a carpentry joint. Um, so this again was the Powderhorn and the Central Neighborhood joining together oh. on an effort and that was an area that had problems with crack houses and dealing mm -hmm. and things, lots of um, dilapidated properties. So we did this comprehensive block redevelopment in about 1993, we completed it. So I think that's where we got hooked up with the neighborhood because it's, that's a very attractive, experience. right, yeah, with the two neighborhood groups, with attractive projects, with um, challenging situations. Yeah. And, they invited us into and not least of which is just working with neighborhood groups well yeah. as you were saying earlier i think a lot of meetings different schedules yeah, yeah. partnerships right yeah. lots of personalities well, you, i wanted to ask about partnerships so in addition to the the block clubs which is literally on that grassroots level and then the larger neighborhoods that deborah was mentioning yeah. who are some of the other partners because an effort like this doesn't happen just with goodwill and intention you got to start there right. and then right. financial partners and well, other the kinds neighborhood central neighborhood improvement association mm -hmm. and powderhorn park neighborhood association are the two neighborhood organizations. Um, then we have the, the funders. We have the Greater Minneapolis Metropolitan Housing Corporation that came in with the seed money. Um, we have the Local Initiative Support Corporation. Um, they brought in some project money. The Minneapolis Community Development Agency, Riverside Bank, the Homes Initiative, and I hope I'm not forgetting it. Quite anybody. a crew, though. Nice yes, that they all came yes, to the table. Right, right. Um, we've got a few more minutes left, but I wanted not to miss the fact that you, Deborah, are a talented artist, and you brought some pieces that you've worked on. Yep. And before we go in more about the artist housing, <laughs> would you be willing to, to show us maybe piece by piece some of these nice um, objects that you brought here and hold yeah. them up for us? I've been a doll maker for... Oh, actually, since I got out of college. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like to put them in little settings. They're my little storytelling tool. And this one, this one I call my mother house. It's, it's, um, it's very cozy. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, cozy reading, and then yeah. it, it, and takes you, it takes you somewhere else. And mm -hmm. just to make sure that our viewers see it, we've got books down here. Mm -hmm. We've got a few fronds, I think. Uh, it's got yeah. a great crane flying in the background. Yeah. And is that mom yeah. and a child yeah. reading? Yeah, reading. reading can take you. Very take cozy. You I love the expression that you do, and we'll see more here on yeah. the other faces. What else do you have? And, and these are actually in sort of different configurations. You have the box yeah, like here. Well, mm -hmm. the thing about dolls is I like to play with them. <laughs> I like to give them places to go and things to do. Like these are my little, these are my little uh, water women, which when I put it in my spell check said it's not a word. Water man is a word, but water woman well, isn't. Well, we'll change that. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I like the idea of just, you know, taking your, your own journey and I always make them a couple pieces of luggage. To well, you with. need that. I, I mean, mean if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're going to make dolls, you have to play with I don't know if our camera's going to catch it, but it almost looks like this person here is blowing into the sail and yeah. powering, is that herself, uh, along her life's journey there. That's sweet. Yeah. That's very nice. I, and, I like the and boats. The, uh, characterization it, of the waves here. This is yeah, and the, the wire serves two functions. It's the water and it keeps it from tipping oh, over. <laughs> yeah, I was being abstract there, Debbie. Yeah. And this is, my, this is my little summer house. Oh, isn't that nice? And again, yeah. I, I'm hoping, I know the camera can yeah. get in there, but I hope our viewers can see um, the, the shells that you work with there. It's yeah. lovely. And then the leaves well, yeah, I, my, my son and I, when we go out on walks, we find things. So yeah. we, when we go to the beach, we, I bring things home. I'm constantly bringing things home. One of the things I make is um, a doll that's a woman in a crow suit, and she's just got a pocket full of stuff because crows will gather things. Oh, yeah, up. They're, yeah. they're gatherers, and mm -hmm. that's, that's me in my studio. What else do you have here? The other, the other things I make are angels. Oh yeah. But they're they're angels of a different sort. This one I call an earth angel. Mm-hmm. Nice bead work yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. Beads and leaves and mm -hmm. earth tone colors. And this is this is the angel actually I started making for myself when I started making my living as an artist. This is what I live on art. <laughs> and congratulations this is, on yeah, that. Yeah. This impressive. is this is my angel for letting go of things, yeah. which you which you have to do if you're going to try and live on on your own work. Well. You got to. <laughs> and and your, your pieces, though, are in various places around the Twin Cities. Yeah, Upton yeah. Art in Calhoun Square. The Bee Below has my things. Yeah. We do art. Come to Powderhorn Art Fair. That's a great thing that happens in that our neighborhood. When is that happening? Uh, the first weekend in August, it's the 7th and 8th. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's a great Early art August. fair to come to. Indeed it is. Yeah, it's the same weekend as Uptown, but you can, when you get tired, you can step out and sit under a tree. In the yeah. yeah, Powderhorn area among yeah. other artists yeah. represented. Well, we do have just a moment mm -hmm. left, and I wanted to commend you all for coming together around a very important definition. Mm -hmm. And this ties in with, I, I assume, who is um, sort of invited to take a look at these artists' houses. And, and what you have is a definition of an right. artist. And Michelle, mm -hmm. would you just read that off? Sure. It's one who produces, practices, creates, and or sells their arts or crafts. Artists define themselves by their creative abilities. 
They articulate their creativity through a chosen medium, which may include visual, graphic, literary, performance, or textile apparel arts. That's well said, yeah. succinct. And right. you came up that, with that in kind of a cons consensus of, of yeah, We went to artists community. in the neighborhood and said, what do you think an, what an artist is? And they boiled it down and, and this the, is what yeah. you came up with. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, ladies, we're just out of time, but I know if people want to get in touch about Artists on Chicago, there's mm -hmm. a phone number they could call. What right. is that? It's 612-827-5527. Okay, and that's the PRG right. number, and you'll mm -hmm. route them through to other artists? or yeah, uh, they can call us yeah. and we'll figure Real out what they, and all that. they need yeah. to talk to. Michelle, thanks. Yeah. Thank Pleasure you, to have Bill. you on the show. Yeah. Deborah. Thank you. nice thank to you. meet you and nice to see your art. Oh, thank it's you. Pleasure. <laughs> well, we'll be back to talk folk music with Kevin Kling and John Van Orman right after this interesting art fact. Well, we shouldn't be surprised at the amount of participation in the arts here in Minnesota. And part of that is folk music, folk music and dance. It's big here in the Gopher State, and there's a new organization in town to uh, help promote that. Folk Song and Dance of Minnesota. And with me to talk about that is Kevin Kling, who is a member of the board. That's right. High time they got you on one of those I boards. Know, that's right. And John Van Orman, also on the board, and a well-known musician and performer here in the Twin Cities. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. And thank thanks you for the lead on this, because it really is a new organization. How old is this? Uh, it's uh, been organized in the, the past year. Okay. Uh, though uh, members have been involved in organizations that have been around the cities for some years. Our uh, director, Deborah Martin, is the founder of the Cedar Cultural Center, for, mm -hmm. for instance, and uh, was right. also the artistic director of uh, the Minnesota Folk Festivals in the 70s. Right. Minnesota Star, I think, was mm -hmm. the organization That's right. involved in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A couple hundred years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is as though there hasn't been great folk music going on for generations in the Twin Cities, the upper Midwest. Oh, Minnesota is a wonderful place for folk yeah. music. I mean, there's a, a great tradition of that, and we have performers like John Kerner here, and of course, yeah. uh, people like um, Bob Dylan, Leo Kotke, you know, yeah, indeed. coming out of Minnesota. So what there's do you a great think gives, tradition. gives the impetus to that? I mean, what are the traditions in Minnesota that gives us that voice? Well, I think people here uh, have, uh, it being largely in immigrant culture, where people have held on traditions and, and valued them. Uh, hmm. uh, um, so it's cultural maintenance in a way. I mean, mm -hmm. bottom line, people want to remember what was going on in the old country or where they mm -hmm. came from. Yeah. That sort of thing. Kevin, how'd they, how'd they line you up? Because I know you're a busy guy in your own right. Yeah, well, basically, uh, John gave me a call. Oh, and, okay. Uh, <laughs> and John and I are friends from way back. And yeah. I've got an interest in this uh, from also from a storytelling perspective. Um, the tradition and the folk involved with storytelling is so similar to the music. And it's, it's just wonderful to see these traditions uh, come to life because most of my involvement is the fact that I think it's still a living form, that a lot of people think of it as, as an old form, but in reality it's for people, whether, you know, at the time. So yeah. I'm excited because it's not a revitalization for the art, it's a revitalization for people to get involved with the art. It's almost a paradox, because almost everybody comes from some personal background, tradition, ethnic history mm -hmm. for which music and dance was a part, and yet I bet there are a number of people out here watching this show that really don't identify with folk music, and yet this is about their own lives. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know once, uh, not, well, a few years ago, Kevin, you were on the show and you brought, I think, was it the same I think I did, yeah. instrument here? Yeah. Now, is this just something you carry around in the car all the time, or and why'd you bring this? No, this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a didgeridoo, and uh, this is, I, I got in Australia, it's probably one of the older folk instruments, I guess, yeah. uh, and it's a, a piece of eucalyptus that ants actually hollow out and the Australian Aborigines um, cut off and, and blow through and make a sound, and so it's a... You still doing the circular uh, breathing? Yeah, I am. Are you? Because that's yeah. what it takes to do this on a continuous basis. That's right, yeah. Can you uh, gear up very quickly and uh, give us sure. two quick breaths? Well, it's not the prettiest thing to look at. No, that's but. all right. <laughs> we'll be right. listening. All right. Imagine, if you will, close your eyes, folks, and just listen to Kevin Kling on the didgeridoo. Wow, and 
then they came running. They do. That's nice. Thanks. And uh, John, you brought a number of instruments, which yes. we're not going to get a chance to hear you play mm -hmm. all. Um, but why don't you just, for our viewers, just hold up, if you will, what you brought and tell them what some of your uh, instrumentation is that Certainly. you play. Uh, and this sort of reflects uh, the breadth of, of the festival, too. I mean, we're uh, representing various traditions. Uh, for instance, Swallow the Earth is uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, African material. We have, uh, as, you know, as well as the European traditions that are being represented. Well, for those of us that don't know, and what is this This is this a hurdy-gurdy. This is a hurdy-gurdy. And uh, this is uh, one I made that's styled after uh, typical French instruments of uh, the 19th century. The hurdy-gurdy is an instrument uh, that's found in various European cultures. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, classified as a bowed fiddle. Well, and I'm like impressed. You, you made this, you said. Mm -hmm. Very yes. impressed. I love the wood. That's a beautiful piece of, of work that you did there. Um, I want to get to some other uh, actual Certainly. played music, but you also have a couple of other instruments that mm -hmm. I think you're very well known for. Yes. Uh, this is a, a gut strung banjo, uh, a banjo unlike the sort of uh, steel strung. Uh, brash and loud instruments. Oh, dueling banjos, these that kind days. of thing. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. a, a more uh, in keeping with the banjo's origins as an African American folk instrument. Uh, the banjo is likely to have descended from uh, African string instruments that uh, were brought to the United States via the West Indies. Very interesting. And yes. this, of course. And this is a concertina. Um, there are a variety of instruments that are called concertinas. Sometimes here in Minnesota, uh, button accordion players call their instruments concertinas. Oh. Uh, this is an Anglo concertina. Um, people might be familiar with this as an instrument that's associated with 19th century sailors. Sort oh, of yes, the, the stereotypical a instrument. Or something. Exactly, yes. yes. Well, it's a beautiful instrument. Again, very dramatic with the, uh, the cuts here and things like that. Well, tell you, why don't we take a quick break and go to a, a clip of uh, a colleague of yours, Dick Henseld, uh, yes. whom we re recorded earlier playing, and clue me in here, John, he's playing a, a, a whistle? The Northumbrian small pipes, which are pipes. Uh, a bagpipe from the north of England. Oh, wonderful. Okay, Dick Henseld, we'll be right back. Well, thank you, Dick. A pleasure to have you playing here for our Artifacts viewers. Um, and of course, one of the things that you all do with the new organization is put on events. And there's a big yeah. one coming up. What, what, what's the date and where is it? On the 17th and 18th of July at the Midway Stadium uh, where the Saints play. Oh, sure. People will be Saint familiar Paul. with yeah. that. Yes, in yeah. St. Paul. It's the Midway Folk Festival. It's uh, the first of what will be an annual event. We're really excited about it. We well, have I saw your lineup, uh, it's John. Incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. You want to rattle off just a few names? Here? Well, uh, among others, there's uh, Dick will be playing, uh, Lou Killen, who's uh, from England again, uh, uh, an excellent world-class singer of traditional song, John Kerner, 
uh, Charlie McGuire, who I understand is going to be visiting you. He's on this CR show. Mm -hmm. That's right. Eric <laughs> Keltonimi, uh, and, and many others. And oh, it yeah. really reflects just what yeah. a, a wealth of traditional singers and, uh, and uh, performers and, and musicians we have here in Minnesota. It's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. Well, congratulations on that. I, I think we can't get enough venues open for this kind of music because it's around. But as I know you and I were talking once, Kevin, we got to get this marketed better. We got to get the word out and let people know it, the yeah. talent that's here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing what's in this state. It's just amazing. I mean, I, it seems like the, the world knows more about us than we do in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so to br bring this stuff home is, is just people are going to be floored by yeah. the talent. Now, you're both on the board. How large a board is it? Is, is this one of those 512 uh, member boards, or is this a small? No, it's small and doughy. growing. Is yeah. It? Uh, yeah, it but is. But it's, it's a really nice board. Um, wonderful people. Uh, Peter Yarrow from Peter, Paul, and Mary mm -hmm. is on our board. He's been very active, uh, very helpful. Um, and of course, Peter's been associated with the folk music scene nationally sure. and internationally for years. Uh, he's involved in other festivals and other parts of the country. So he's a real valuable resource right. for us. Well, that's great. Let's take another break. And again, earlier, uh, John was nice enough to pick up an instrument and do a tune for us. And that tune is? I'll be doing uh, an American folk song called The Cuckoo. Okay, that sounds great. So mm -hmm. again, let's take a, a listen here to John Van Orman. Well, the cuckoo is a pretty bird and she sings as she flies and she never hollers cuckoo till the fourth day of July Jack of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds Don't I know you? Thank you, John. Nice to hear some nice tunes in, on the show here. Um, we kind of mentioned tangentially earlier that there's a lot of music around here, and other than festivals like you all are helping to put on, where can people here watching our show, where can they go out and hear this kind of music on a weekly basis or every month if they wanted to? There are a couple of venues. There's the Cedar Cultural Center, which mm -hmm. often has uh, excellent performers. That's over in the West Bank in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Myself and uh, a few other performers uh, play at the Loring Bar, which is a well, good. That's a nice uh, venue it's a, for this. a nice. It's a great venue mm -hmm. for alternative music sure. in the cities. Still going? Oh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And they're they're uh, an important resource yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in, in this part of the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. They're down on what uh, Penn? On Penn in, in Ridgefield. Uh, Ridgefield yeah. Yes, yeah. great organization. Great, great place. Well, now I know you've got the event coming up. I also think maybe some folks uh, might just want to get involved with the organization, whether they're practicing uh, musicians or can just civilians join and yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, get a contribution. Be, um, and uh, we're soliciting for volunteers to be involved with the festival. Oh, all right. Oh, it's going to be a blast. Yeah, get in on this. Okay, now um, one of you is going to rattle off a number here that if people want to find out more about the group and the event. Right. Um, 
for volunteers. If okay. you if you do want to volunteer, which would be great, and it is going to be a really fun day. Um, that number is area code six five one six four seven. 0722. Now that's just specifically to volunteer for the one event. No, right. That's, uh, and that's also uh, if people want to call for advanced tickets. Okay, so the, okay, so the tickets are volunteering. Mm -hmm. Is there a general number then for the organization? That is uh, the general number. Same yes. thing. Yeah. Six five one. Call that our number. Zero seven two two. That's okay. the number. Great, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We've run out of time. Thank oh, you. Thanks so a lot. Good to see you here, yeah, John. We'll see you there. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and guess what? More music coming up. The Singing Ranger, Charlie McGuire, will be here with some friends. It's happening right now on Artifacts. <laughs> And take a look, go down. Take a look at that river, go down. I'll introduce you to her big river, Mississippi. Surely is a friend of mine. Big river, Mississippi, she's white and fair. But behind a big city, she gets lost down there. Go down. Take a look at that. To her big river, Mississippi Surely is a friend of mine Big river, Mississippi I found my home Flowing like a dancer When I wake up in the morning She's my long time pal It's true We met the same way I'm telling you If you can't see her Even driving slow Charlie there McGuire. Are, Phil. Yes, wonderful tune. Good to see you. The River. Who wrote that song? I did. That's Sing an original. And Ranger. Sing yes. and Ranger, Charlie yes. McGuire. Hot music. That's great. Who you got playing with you here? Uh, right over here, this is Gordy Abel on the bass. How do you do, Gordy? And right behind me is Lisa Fugley. Lisa, thank you very much. That was great. You do a lot of tunes as the Singing Ranger around our natural resources. You got some events coming up uh, later this right. month and next. Right. What, what's happening? Um, this month, uh, Lisa and uh, Gordy and I are at Elliott Park for their uh, summer concert series. That's just not far from our studios here. That's right, and that's early in the month of July, right, so some of our uh, viewers July might... July 7th. Yeah, yeah, but then in the month of August, you've got a couple of great sound and uh, concerts. Right, and then we go uh, on to um, uh, the Lake Harriet Bandshell. That's mm -hmm. August 6th. 
in the evening, and then we're also at Nicollet Island on August 12th. That's great. And that's just a couple of the things that you do as the year goes on as the Singing Ranger. Oh, yeah. We write, I write songs about the Mississippi River for the people yeah. of the United States. And that's wonderful because it's a great resource right here in our town, and you're a great resource, and I want to thank the performers that you brought with you. That's great. Charlie, there's a phone number people could call if they want to get more information right. about you and some of the events that you're part of. Right. Please call the National Park Service at area code 651 290-4160. Okay, Charlie McGuire, the Singing Ranger. Now you folks stay tuned because we'll be back to wrap the show right after a look at a workshop that happened uh, last month at an urban retreat for arts and education, part of the Annenberg Initiative. Stay tuned. Without me? Oh, no. No. One, two, here we go. One, two, three, and back. One, two, three, and stop. One, two, three, four, uh, ah. Well, our thanks to Paul Augustin, who's been documenting the Annenberg Arts Education Initiative, and what you just saw was, uh, I guess, a dance workshop that happened last month at their Urban Retreat for the Arts. Uh, at this point in the show, we usually do a little bit of chit-chat here. Wanted to announce that the uh, Brave New Workshop down at Calhoun Square has a show up, a new show called Got Apathy, uh, or We Are Now Serving Beer and Wine. I think that's part of the title. And the reason I think this is very important is this is a landmark. This is their 225th comedy review. So congratulations to those folks. Founded, of course, by Dudley Riggs uh, in the 1950s. Uh, another interesting and geographically centered uh, event is happening at uh, Intermedia Arts on uh, Lindale Avenue South. Uh, it's uh, their annual Minneapolis 55408 exhibition. Um, they have two and three dimensional art. They've got film and video and multimedia works. And it features artists from our own backyard, folks that live in that zip code, 55408. Uh, that runs uh, July 4th through August 15th. And I, I just think that's a neat concept for an exhibit. Also, uh, an interesting and uh, uh, good sounding uh, play here, written and performed by Edgar L. Davis called Island of Mirrors. Uh, Buffy Sedlicek is the director. It's going to be at the Loring Playhouse. Uh, it looks like for two performances only, July 20 and 21st. The name of the show is Island of Mirrors. I believe um, it's a reprise. He did this uh, once before. Now, our last point I wanted to bring up here, I was going through one of those um, hospitality journals you do, and there was an ad. This has nothing to do with the arts. There's an ad for Lakeville, which is, I think I have a brother-in-law out in Lakeville, and they have a wonderful little ad here that talks about, come out here, hold your meeting in Lakeville. Fair enough, but if you read the very end of the ad, it says, Lakeville, conveniently close, safely south. Safely south? You know, like south of St. Paul, maybe, west of Wisconsin. What the heck do they mean, safely south? Gone south, maybe. I don't know about that. Now, next month on Artifacts, we're going to talk with some folks about the Open Book. That's the name, I think it's the new name of the new Literary Arts Center that's going up uh, in the next couple years on Washington Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. And a reminder, get your pencils out because at the end of this show, we've got our calendar events, great things going on. We'll see you next time on Artifacts. I'm Phil Lindsay. See you soon.
every day we walk the same streets, the same corner that smells the same eyes. Simply staying alive, we see the world through the same eyes. The daily questions what we got, have or have not. If you ain't out to get mine, then I'm out to get ours. You don't excuse to be sour. Black people used to be power. Pick with a fish now, who counts? See Popo every hour. They know the spot like who does it. Over my block, steady buzzing. And I know that they know who runs it. But they ain't there when the guns it. But let me pack a steel weapon and let the coat when I'm stepping. And I get frisked down, past back with big talks and questions. We're here to live, we forget. So all my kids be my dead. I got no time to set up. Drive out with text and jet it. Never been caught or arrested. So God bless us for petty. When evil thoughts was invented. Return to send the convention. And every ghetto and jungle, they keep the wisdom and humble. So Shaytar made me stumble. My foundation can't crumble. 